Dragon Ballers, if you're looking to buy a Dragon Ball Super or One Piece sealed product, make sure to get 5% off using my link to Mystic TCG down in the description. You can also sell cards to them using their Facebook link, which is also down in the description. Yo, what's going on One Piecers? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, I wanna go over my beginner's guide for how to play the Green Kid deck. This is a deck that I've pretty much been one trick ponying whenever it comes time to play a locals. I've been playing all other decks a fair amount and trying to learn as much as I can because I'm a firm believer in if you want to beat a deck, you got to play the deck to really learn ins and outs of it. But again, like like I said, whenever it comes time to play a locals, I pretty much pull out the, the green kid. So we're gonna go over that in today's video. For those of you that don't know me, I've been doing Dragon Ball Super content for several years now. And I kind of started the basis of my channel just by wanting to get my opinion out there because uh, historically, I've been a pretty successful Dragon Ball player. I'm hoping to do the same in One Piece and the Treasure Cups and everything. But yeah, so with my experience, I'm going to go over how to play Kid. And this should be helpful for anyone who is new to the deck or wants to learn how to play it or even maybe play against it. So we'll go over that in the video. So first thing I want to talk about is why I like the Green Kid deck. It's unlike a lot of the other decks, you know, basically the other meta decks being Zoro, Kaido, and even Dofi to an extent, uh, and maybe some of the blue-purple decks. I think that kid is really strong because you don't really need a super specific opener to do well with the deck. Like I'd say in Zoro, a lot of times you want to go turn one Nami, turn two Nico, and if you don't do that every game, you might be in a little bit of a pickle. Uh, Kaido, same thing. If you don't hit Onigashima on three Dawn, you might be in trouble because you can't follow up with the uh, with the six draw King the following turn. So if you miss your curve in those decks, you're in a bit of trouble. But in kid you have a lot of things that play for one cost that play for three costs so you can open up a lot of different hands and play well and the cards are very mid-rangey which just speaks to my you know dragon ball play style where i have cards that help with a lot of situations that the game presents and if you're able to play the, through those situations properly the deck is going to reward you for that that's why i like kid a lot it's very reminiscent of yellow and dragon ball super which is a very similar play style so that's why i like it now the first thing i want to go over with Kid is what I go for in Mulligan. So of course, you do want to start with a one drop, but again, that's the nice thing about Kid is that you have about eight options you could play maximum for a solid one drop. Of course, we have our four Jewelry Bonnie, and then however many Momonosuke you play, I personally play two, and I'll link my profile for Kid down in the description. You guys can check that out if you want, you want to see my build. But yeah, I play two Momonosuke, so that's giving you uh, six different one drop options for turn one. I think my odds of opening one when I did the math was 68%, so that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, of course you can play the full four Momonosuke or three Momonosuke, whatever you want to do. But of course we're looking for a one drop. If I don't see a one drop, a lot of times I'm going to uh, mulligan, depending on matchup, like against Kaido, I might not mulligan if I don't see a one drop because a lot of times one drops are just getting picked off anyway later on in the game. But still, like, you want to start with a one drop. And then of course you want to start with a, th a three drop as well if you already have a one drop because these are typically our turn two plays. So if I have a hand like this, odds are I'm probably keeping it. And then of course, maybe if you already have these and you see a basil or some other sort of five drop, you may keep that as well because that's your turn one, your turn two, and then your turn three play, right? So that's a pretty ideal mulligan that I like to go for. But again, it can be a bit matchup dependent and you'll of course learn more about what cards you need for specific matchups by playing the deck. That's more of just like a general use case thing. Now what I wanna do is talk a bit about the turn progression, right? Because uh, unlike Dragon Ball, One Piece actually does play on a curve to an extent. Again, I, I like this deck because you can kind of deviate from the curve, but um, the curve does matter a lot more in One Piece that doesn't Dragon Ball, right? So let's say we go first. We have one Dawn. A lot of times I'm just playing Jewelry Bonnie, passing my turn. I don't think there's any deck in the game that can kill a turn one Jewelry Bonnie for the most part. I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, no, actually, I really don't think there is. So yeah, we'll do that a lot of times. Let's say we've gone second. Now you have a few options here, right? So we'll have two Dawn to work with. We can play Jewelry Bonnie, of course, or Momo. And we can do one of two things. We can either activate her ability and go for our top five search, right? The other thing we could do is of course, leave her in active mode. Uh, and we could maybe play another one drop. Maybe you play a second uh, Jewelry Bonnie. Maybe you play Momonosuke. I don't love that play too, too much because depending on what matchup you're up against, they can punish that pretty effectively. I actually had a game at Locals today where my, my opponent in the mirror match played out two Momos and I ended up playing a Cat Viper and killing one, right? So maybe that's not the most ideal play, but you could go for a uh, Capone next to that Jewelry Bonnie, right? Uh, again, it really depends on matchup. I don't like this in the mirror because they can just rest either of them and just swing. Um, but this is an option if you want to set up for later turns and you know your opponent doesn't have a ton of removal, like maybe against blue, I would do something like this. A lot of times though, I do really like just using the Jewelry Bonnie, especially if I have another one in hand or another Momo in hand, because it eats up an attack and it almost serves as a blocker in that respect. So I actually do like this play quite a bit. 
So that's a turn one, depending on if you go first or second, right? Now I wanna talk about some things depending on if we go uh, to our turn two going first or second, right? So let's say we went first, played the Jewelry Bonnie, couldn't use the effect, obviously. And now we're going into our turn two with three Dawn to work with. So in this scenario, we have a couple options because we have different three drops in the deck. We could play a Rhizo here, and this is the card that I don't see every build play. I quite like it though. Um, there are some matchups where he just really, really shines. Um, so you can go for a Rhizo on two, or you can go for an Okiku on two. Now I like Okiku a lot against the kind of slower control decks like the blues and the purples, because they might play a blocker either on their turn one or turn two, and Okiku, if they don't kill it, can go right in there, rest the blocker, and then maybe you can swing at the blocker with the leader or whatever. This puts on a lot of good pressure. The Rhizo I like for matchups where I'm trying to grind them out. So that's more like the Reds where as long as you outlast them, you're pretty much going to kill them. And this is really good in the mirror match as well because uh, he can put you up in advantage against your opponent in the mirror match. But the thing with Rhizo is he requires you to have two cards in rest mode uh, for him to draw one when he swings. Now that can be a little bit tough to do in a summoning sickness game, right? Where you're not able to you know swing with cards willy nilly like maybe you are in Dragon Ball Super. But... The nice thing about this specific curve, and again, you have a lot of consistent ways to do this because you can have Jewelry Bonnie or Momonosuke. So let's say this is our turn two, right? We played the, the Jewelry Bonnie and we played the Ryzo, right? Now we're gonna go into our five Dawn turn. What's funny is the Jewelry Bonnie has sat there for two turns and not done anything. But again, like depending on the matchup, odds are they probably couldn't kill this. Uh, especially again, if we went first, they're kind of on the back foot in terms of what cards they're playing. So now on this type of curve on our turn three, we can pay one to activate the Jewelry Bonnie, right? And that's gonna give us a card in rest mode for Rizo to now attack and draw a card. So we're netting some really insane value there. And odds are, we probably attach a Dawn to Rizo so you can actually threaten leader. Um, but if they have some sort of character on board you wanna swing into like a rest mode Nami or something, this can obviously swing into that without attaching Dawn. And then we have three Dawn left over, bam, we can go into our Okuku, which I actually think is a perfectly fine turn three play because again, she's gonna threaten those blockers. Um, she kind of like, Okiku like demands removal because if if you don't like she is gonna tear apart the board. That's really really good. Um, so yeah, that's like a, a turn one, two, and three that I really really like. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, this mirror match I had today because the mirror match is obviously something that uh, I mean any mirror match typically takes a fair amount of skill, right? So what I did in this mirror match that was really really interesting. Uh, again, it helped that I went first. I drew a very very good hand for my situation. But here's what it was, right? I played Bonnie on one, right? Just what we talked about. Then we go to my next turn. My opponent played two Momonoskes on their two Dawn, right? So keep in mind, that's their board. I go to my three Dawn. I use one, uh, two Dawn to play the Cat Viper, rest one of the Momos, swing into a Momo. So that Momo just basically was almost like a discard one from hand because it didn't get its effect off. Then on my leftover Dawn, Jewelry Bonnie. Get the value off Jewelry Bonnie, right? Now, again, like I talked about before, Jewelry Bonnie in this scenario serves as a blocker. They're going to attack into it. That's totally fine. She got her value. Um, you don't want to be too, too greedy with the Jewelry Bonnies because, again, in that exact situation, um, if you don't use them immediately, they can definitely die, right? And then maybe I took a damage from Leader. Uh, probably not, actually. I think his only attacker was the one that swung into my, uh, into my Bonnie, right? So now we're going back into my turn three, right? So we're flipping over two more Dawn. And then, bam, slam Basil Hawkins. Uh, it's going to be pretty hard for your opponent to answer Basil Hawkins in the mirror match because uh, they have to have Okiku to do it pretty much. And uh, my opponent, I don't think, was able to set up Okiku in that scenario. So yeah, Freezel, uh, Basil Hawkins was a free slam there. I just combined free and Basil. But yeah, uh, then we go to the next turn. Uh, I'm going to flip over two more Dawn. And then bam, seven drop, just on curve. Like my curve in this game was unreal. Uh, and these are all cards I play high numbers of. Like I play, of course, uh, six one drops. I play four of this, I play four of this, I play three basil. So this could have been a basil, could have been an extra That would have been pretty decent in the scenario as well. And then bam, go to the next turn, flip over two more Dawn, play eight drop. Like really, really good curve for the mirror match that I was in uh, and it helped to go first again. But yeah, I just wanted to give a kind of example of the curve and how, um, you know, playing your characters on their desired turns is gonna set you up really, really well. So at this point, we talked about Mulligan, we talked about the curve, and we talked a bit about the mirror match, which I think is a really important matchup to learn. So what I wanna talk about now are like some really key interactions that can help put you ahead in games when you're able to pull them off, right? And one of the key cards allowing you to do that is the uh, green five drop law blocker. This card, we call it on the team, we call it Hocus Pocus because he does a lot of shenanigans that um, put you in a board state where your opponent kind of can't get out of, right? So let's do this for example. Let's say I'm on three Dawn, right? And on my three Dawn turn, I played Okiku. 
I've come into a lot of scenarios where like, I don't need to attach the Dawn to my Okiku because either my opponent bricked and didn't see their blocker or um, I just want to swing five at face. Like that's perfectly fine. And with this play coming up, swinging five at face is totally fine. You don't care about, you know, missing the Dawn one, right? So going into next turn, uh, you know, Okiku summoning sickness obviously has passed, right? So we're flipping over to five. We attack with Okiku. Again, they didn't have really a priority target that we wanted to rest, so who cares? Then we go into um, swinging with leader, and then we finish the turn playing five drop law, which is going to allow us to pick up Okiku and play Okiku back in active. And this is a couple things. Uh, Okiku is now safe from being KO'd by attacking, obviously, or you know various other effects. Like in the mirror match, they wouldn't be able to play X Drake to kill this. And now we're directing the attacks back at the leader. A lot of one piece in the early game is all about establishing dominance over the board state. And if you're allowing your opponent to attack into your characters at inopportune times, you can fall behind pretty quickly. But this play is going to allow us to protect our board from being attacked and direct any attacks they want to throw at our life, which if we're at five life, we're looking to take like two damage typically early on, right? Uh, we generally are looking to do that. That's going to build our hand, get it nice and healthy. And now we have two attackers potentially. And don't be afraid to attack with the law, by the way. Like depending on board state, once again, don't be afraid to attack with the law. The only time I don't really want to attack with law is when I'm trying to protect my kid eight drop. We'll talk more about that card kind of in its own segment of the video. But yeah, law has a really insane plays. Uh, we have other options besides Okiku, right? So we have the Cat Viper. You know, the thing with One Piece is a lot of times we don't really draw as many cards as we would like to. There's, you know, sometimes where we won't even see a copy of a four of in a game, and that's kind of disheartening. But um, Law kind of fixes that issue because I can, uh, you know, play Neko, uh, Cat Viper, I don't know how this guy's name is pronounced, but I can play Cat Viper on a random turn, tap a blocker, swing at it, tap a key three drop, swing at it. And the upcoming turn, I can play Law. I can just replay Cat Viper if I want to. Or I can swap Cat Viper out maybe for a Ryzo or something, or maybe for um, a one drop blocker, like a Capone, right? Like Law just lets you protect your board and set up different plays. And it's really nice when a card plays another card because this game has summing sickness, right? So going into your opponent's turn with two potential threats is really, really solid. Next up, I wanna talk about the seven drop kid blocker, which is kind of looked at as like the, the starter deck boss monster. It's one of two main bosses in this deck, right? This card provides a whole ton of value because he is almost just like your leader being 7k because he will block, you know, at least one attack per turn and it's a bigger number that your opponent's 5k's can't threaten, right? So when this guy's on the board, your opponent kind of has to attack like 7k minimum just so you don't get the free block with this. And don't get me wrong, there are going to be some scenarios where your opponent will swing 5 to bait you into blocking with this so that they're like 9K or something can swing into this and kill it. You gotta be careful for those scenarios, but if your opponent has a board full of smaller cards, this is gonna be a great block. And even if your opponent is doing the strategy of swinging minimum seven to try and kill this thing on block, this is just so much easier to defend than your leader, right? Because all you have to do is block a seven and then use a 1K instead of using a 2K and a 1K to block a 7K on your leader, right? And the incredible, incredible thing about the seven drop, which is why uh, I don't play Pug Gim Punk Gibson currently, I play Paradise Waterfall because these cards pair so, so well together. It's like unfair when you can pull it off, right? Because again, your opponent's swinging seven, maybe they're swinging eight. You're gonna block with seven. You're gonna Paradise Waterfall, which is not only gonna save your blocker, but it's gonna restand it so you can block again with it. And that's just such an insane combo. That's the reason why I play uh, two Paradise Waterfall is because you know, I want to set up my kid, which I can do on seven dawn or later. Um, but Paris Waterfall is really only kind of good when you have a blocker in play, in my opinion. It's still nice that it's a one drop uh, counter for 2k. And the trigger is definitely not bad either. I mean, obviously I have two copies. I don't really trigger it from life very often. But yeah, Paris Waterfall is only going to be super, super ideal when you have the law or the kid or, you know, some sort, some sort of blocker. Like, obviously with Capone, that's not going to be great because it's a 1k. You're never going to defend a 1k like that, right? But uh, yeah, with your high power blockers, Paradise Waterfall is super, super good. Now, let's talk about the offensive side of the 7-drop kid. Now, what we talked about in several videos at this point, also in the YouTube Shorts section of the channel, go check out YouTube Shorts if you want to see quick tips about One Piece. But yeah, whenever you're swinging at a leader, right, you typically want to swing for 7, like its base stat is, uh, because it's an odd number to an odd number, and that's going to make your opponent use more than just one 2k to get out of it. They're going to have to spend a minimum of two cards to get out of a 7k attack. But keep in mind, this card has a Dawn 1 effect. At the end of your turn, you get to set it inactive so it can block during the following turn. 
Now, what that means is when we attach one Don to it, it's gonna be an 8K, right? Now, I don't love swinging this at a leader for 8K because it's not an odd to an odd, right? They can just go, again, like two 2Ks out of it. If they're playing um, you know, a 4K counter and they have the Don available to use it, that's gonna get out of this for super free because it gets them to 9K when you swing with an 8K. So most of the time, I will attach two Don to this minimum when I'm swinging at leaders because that nine to that to that five demands like two two Ks and a one K or a four K and a one K. And that just feels really good. Basically by using your Dons appropriately, you can get more cards out of your opponent's hand, which is super, super ideal. I loaded this thing up to a 14 K today to swing at a Shanks, right? A 10 K Shanks. So I went odd, uh, sorry, I went even to even. And that's another really important tip because again, with the Don one effect, Maybe you can swing at a character for that 8K. Maybe you can swing at a Basil Hawkins for 8K. Now your opponent needs two cards minimum to defend their Basil if they want to do that, right? Or maybe you would go to uh, 10K with three Dawn if you really wanted to ensure that that character card was going to die. But yeah, generally, this is across all decks for the most part. I generally recommend going um, odd numbers to odd numbers or even numbers to even numbers. Now there is a slight exception to that and that is if your opponent is tapped out and relatively low on cards in hand. I am perfectly fine swinging an 8k, uh, well I guess that would only be one Don attached, swinging an 8k at a leader if my opponent is fully tapped out and again rather low on cards in hand because if they want to pitch two 2Ks to get out of my eight, I'm fine with that. That's a good trade that I'll take. Um, but it's just when they have access to their uh, extra card or event counters, that's when you really want to go stringent to that odds to odds, evens to evens. So next, I want to talk about the eight drop kit because there's actually a lot of intricacies when it comes to using that card well. But first, sorry if you're going out of order. There's one thing I just remembered I wanted to mention about Law, and that is specifically its interaction with Ezo. Ezo is a very powerful on play, which you typically don't see with 2K counters. A lot of 2K counters in the game are typically only played because of the 2K counter value. But Ezo has a really good on play effect. Rest a four or less that lets you attack cards you want to attack or rest, you know, high cost blockers. But again, you're giving up your 2K for that. But Law lets you do that and not feel so bad about it because you can play Law, get Ezo back to your hand, and then, you know, play any low cost card you want to play. Uh, and that feels really nice. So you can use your 2K offensively and then you can pick it up back to your hand. I, I did want to go over that play because it is a card. It is a play that I use very often and it's very important. Sorry for going out of order there. But anyways, let's talk about the eight drop kid because it's the scariest card in the deck. But if used at a poor time, it can actually just straight up lose you a game, believe it or not. So there are a couple ways to use this kid effectively. Let's say you're in a situation where you're at a high life total. You're at like four life going into your eight or 10 dawn turn, which happens again, if you're fighting for board, that's not a super rare circumstance, right? In a lot of those scenarios, just play your eight drop and pass. Do not use its effect. Do not put it in rest mode. Just leave it in active mode. Again, it goes back to what we talked about before. Direct all your opponent's attacks at your life. Take a few life, stock your hand up, get a healthy hand. And if you can load up on 2K counters, that's gonna make your ability to defend your eight drop kid all the easier, right? So that's a really good tactic I like to do, especially, especially if I have an empty board or a very like weak board. Like if I have maybe one other character in play, I don't wanna put any of that in jeopardy by putting this guy in rest mode yet. Now there are scenarios where you can just play him and immediately use his effect because you know your opponent can't effectively kill him. And those are gonna be scenarios where you have like uh, a Capone on board for maybe the previous turn, uh, a Law on board for the previous turn, basically blockers. If you have blockers on board from previous turns, that's gonna be a really good scenario to use your kids activate main, which is gonna protect your leader and all your other characters uh, that aren't kids, I guess. And then you can play, guess what? <laughs> Another blocker. I love to do this type of thing when I'm on 10 Dawn, because what you do is if you have all 10 Dawn, right? You're gonna pay eight for the kid. You're gonna use the effect, put him in rest. You're gonna play a killer. One Dawn goes under your eight drop kid. One Dawn goes under your killer. And now you have so many blockers to defend your eight drop kid, plus hopefully like several 2Ks in hand. That's a really great situation to be in, which is not an uncommon situation to be in either. Now, the great thing here is having at least like two blockers. Let's say, you know, let's say you're not the best player in the world. Let's say you don't have law in play, right? Or you're not the luckiest player in the world. You don't have law in hand, right? Or law on the board. So you have two blockers here. What simply having two blockers does, even one blockers in a lot of scenario, it dissuades your opponent from just loading up a card with like 10 Dawn and swinging at this. Because let's say my opponent dumps 10 Dawn, their leader goes 15 at my eight. It's gonna be pretty hard to justify dumping several, like 
three or four cards to protect my 8k from a 15k swing but as soon as your opponent over commits to attaching dawn to something bam block like cool you dumped four dawn into your leader or uh six dawn into your leader it just got blocked cool um that's something you really want to do so it's really good to play kid when you have an established board preferably with some blockers but that's why i was saying before and a lot of times you're going to just play kid and you're going to pass if you have a high life total because on the next turn guess what you're going into 10 open dawn with an a drop on board that means you can play blockers that means you can do a law play if you have like okiku or something on board and you can establish something for this kid uh to you know make him less of an easy target equip one and guess what when you equip one he's 9k so that's the perfect number to swing at a character and then you can attach one to killer you can uh you know do more shenanigans whatever the case is but that's a really good and effective way to use the eight drop kid again don't just play him and just use the activate main thinking okay my opponent's never gonna get over this they're just gonna literally equip 10 dons to the leader swing into this and your eight drop investment is dead they kind of skip their turn to do that because they use all our dawn just to kill your one card but this guy didn't even get to attack yet right he barely got any value and if you have an, a totally empty board and that's what just happened you're probably going to lose the game, unfortunately. But yeah, you definitely want to use this guy as effectively as possible. So if you have an empty board, play him. Don't rest him yet. Wait till the next turn. If you have a healthy board with some blockers, feel free to use the activate main. Play another blocker, a killer or a component or something. That's a really good situation to be in. All right, I think we'll end this video talking about how to use the leader's ability in the most effective ways. Because um, this leader is looked at as perhaps the most powerful leader in the set. Maybe not the most powerful deck in the format. But the leader alone is a powerhouse. Like being able to swing multiple times when you can just load a ton of Dawn is really threatening. How do we use that super effectively? The classic scenario to use the leader ability is when your opponent has one life remaining. You can have no cards on board. Uh, you, they have one life remaining. What you can simply do is just load seven Dawn on your leader. That's a 12K swing. You go face, odds are man, they're taking it if your leader's 12K. And then you tap three, discard a card, swing again at their open life, and you probably won the game. This is especially effective if your opponent's tapped out on Dawn, they don't have access to their two or 4K counters. If they do have access to their 4K counters and they have a pretty healthy hand, like six, seven cards, you do wanna be careful about that play. But generally, that is one of the uh, you know most typical game ending plays of the deck. Another thing I like to do with that effect, let's say it's not exactly a game ending situation, there are going to be some times where you draw a hand like this, you draw a hand like this, you draw a hand like this, where your entire hand is just tons of cards that have no counter power, right? That's a big, big, big problem. So when I do have hands like this, uh, I'm going to dedicate some of my Dawn to playing cards, but I'm also going to dedicate some of my Dawn to using my leader's multi-attack because if I just have a hand that I can't really use defensively, what am I going to do just sitting there as like a sitting duck, right? I'm going to use that hand to get more attacks on my leader and kind of become an aggro deck and that's what a mid-range deck is able to do a mid-range deck is able to pivot between more of like a control style like you know sitting on a drop kid and just shutting your opponent out of the game or just pitching your hand and swinging multiple times with a seven or nine k leader like that's a really good thing to do and i will go for that game plan if i get unlucky and just draw a ton of uh, uncounterable cards i did construct this deck in a way where hopefully those hands become pretty far few and in between but if it does happen uh, I generally just go for that game plan because I want to make use of the cards in my hand, not just have them sitting dead in my hand. Now, another time where I'm a little bit more liberal on the three energy effect to attack multiple times is in the Kaido matchup, especially going second, right? Because going first, or sorry, them going first, they're going to pass on one Dawn. You're going to go two Dawn. Uh, maybe you'll play a Jewelry Bonnie and resolve its effect, right? So you got a little bit of a, a plus there. They'll swing into this, whatever. Going into their three Dawn, they're going to play Onigashima. That's going to put them on six Dawn their next turn, right? So if I, let's just say, wanted to set up an Okiku, which unfortunately is going to suffer from summoning sickness, going into their next turn, they can just pop this with King if they had Onigashima, right? So that's a big problem. I think investing a lot into the board against uh, Kaido in the early turns is not so great. I think later on, if you can establish, you know, seven drop, which they can't really kill besides Kaido 10, and then go into uh, eight drop the following turn, I do think that's a pretty strong board to establish against Kaido. But in the early turns, I'm just trying to do damage to my leader, man, because uh, if the game goes too, too long, they are pretty heavily advantaged with all the boss monsters they'll play. 
So yeah, in the early turns against Kaido, I will load up a fair amount of my Dawn onto my leader. I'll go like, you know, if I have six Dawn, let's say, I'll go like seven, I'll tap three, get an extra swing, and then I'll spend one more maybe on a Jewelry Bonnie or a Capone or something, right? So yeah, that's generally the other time where I use this, where I really need to rush them down fast because I know I'm not advantaged in the later parts of the game. Uh, again, that's mainly in the in the Kaido matchup. Also, I'd say probably the blue-purple Kaido matchup as well. Uh, blue-purple Croc actually doesn't really have anything good to, to get out of the uh, eight drop king or eight drop kid with. Like they just don't have like a Kaido boss monster to swing into this. Their highest thing's 9K, right? And um, you know, you can defend that pretty effectively again if you have a board full of blockers. But yeah. Um, that's what I want to talk about, just using the leader ability effectively. If I have a ton of cards I can't counter with, I will use it a lot. Obviously, it's great for that end game push, and I also like to use it a lot against Kaido because you need to kind of become an aggro deck when you face Kaido. But anyways, guys, that's what I got for you in today's video. Um, I think I went over a lot of helpful tips, but if I miss anything or if you have any questions, please do drop in the comments. Hope this was helpful to you guys. Let me know if this was helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.